We're driven by the search for better. But when it comes to hiring, the best way to search for a candidate isn't to search at all. Don't search match with Indeed. Indeed is your matching and hiring platform with over 350 million global monthly visitors, according to Indeed data, and a matching engine that helps you find quality candidates fast. Ditch the busy work. Use Indeed for scheduling, screening, and messaging so you can connect with candidates faster. Leveraging over 140 million qualifications and preferences every day, Indeed's matching engine is constantly learning from your preferences, so the more you use Indeed, the better it gets. Join more than 3.5 million businesses worldwide that use Indeed to hire great talent fast. And listeners of this show will get a $75 sponsored job credit to get your jobs more visibility at Indeed.com slash BlueWire. Just go to Indeed.com slash BlueWire right now and support our show by saying that you heard about Indeed on this podcast. That's Indeed.com slash BlueWire. Terms and conditions apply. Need to hire? You need Indeed. From the hills of Strawberry Canyon, I'm Coin Dang, and this is the Golden Bear Cast. Let's go, go Bears! What is up, Cal fans? We are back with another episode of the California Golden Bear Cast. I am one of your co-hosts, Andy. Alongside me, as always, is Rob. Rob, what is happening? How are you doing? Most importantly, how in the world was the ridiculous Thanksgiving feast that you prepared for yourself? <laughs> I did not prepare for just for myself. All right. I had a couple people over. Um, our mutual friend, young one, was there. Uh, he enjoyed himself, thoroughly ate, brought some beers, brought some Tokyo beers over. So we cracked a couple of those open. And uh, yeah, it was a fun night. It was a good day. Um, I, I don't know if this is a hot take, but. I mean, Thanksgiving, definitely the best part about Thanksgiving is heating up leftovers like for the three, four days afterwards. Like that's that was that was why I cooked that great of a meal is because I, I wanted turkey leftovers. confit. So I had I had a leftover turkey from uh, a turkey I had cooked a couple days before for another party and uh, no one ate the dark meat. So I had two like thighs left of great dark meat. And then I had some spiral ham left from that event, too. So I had that. And then I, I uh, put it in the oven with some uh, orange soda just to give it a little bit of sugar and a little bit of a glaze. And then uh, it was duck confit. Um, we want, I wanted to do something different this year, so uh, I went with duck. Because I didn't think I was going to have turkey, but we did. So we had three mains on top of like all of those side dishes. <laughs> Damn, it looked good. So good. Master chef worthy. I, I appreciate the kind words. And so got ba- Go ahead. No, go ahead. No, I mine... was just going to say, anecdotally from what you just said, Josh, our dear friend Josh, who's now in Boston, texted me this morning and was or last night, and he was like, hey, uh, I've seen all your cooking on your Instagram, uh, so I just wanted to ask, do you have any recipes for a guy who's living alone for the first time? <laughs> Dude, <laughs> I, I love like, it. Sure, yeah, let me, uh, I'll throw you something your way. But the young anyways. man is out there in the world. <laughs> he is, he is. So, I mean, basically from there, it was just a downhill train wreck. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it was. That was the peak. Yeah. Thursday was the peak. And then uh, what did what, what did I do Friday? I don't even remember what I did Friday. I, I, I did some Black Friday shopping via Amazon and the Internet. But uh, what about yourself? How what was what was that like ramp up period from like into Saturday for you? Oh, I you mean- were on vacation, so it's different. I basically read in the hammock. I finished the premonition by Michael Lewis started the alchemist, which I then finished later in the trip, which was really a fun read. And then, um, yeah, I went surfing from like five to six thirty, like through the sunset. That was my, that was my lead up. And then we went out. Oh yeah. We went out. Gosh, Sayulita <laughs> is so fun. We went to this bar that's like a cocktail bar, but it's it feels you walk in, you're like, oh, this is a dive bar. But they make delicious handmade margaritas for five dollars. And so I had way too many of those. 
And then we, I believe that was the night we got. Oh was no! Was that the spice? Was that the that wasn't the spicy night, right? That wasn't the was that the same night as the spicy night? No, 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 no. I'm off on my night, but it's, it doesn't matter. It's I was blur. still surfing. It's a blur. It was a blur. Yeah, <laughs> Friday night we. Yeah. Oh my gosh, I can't even describe Friday night. It was such a disaster. So uh, that I will not. I will spare the details. Suffice it to say, we met a couple, went out to plan a dinner with them, and the dinner went horribly wrong, and it wasn't our fault. And so I won't put it out into the universe because nobody deserves that, but it was like straight out of a movie, and I like couldn't believe what I was seeing. And um, yeah, that was it. So that was my... I should have known. I, that, that was super fortuitous. <laughs> it was the universe telling you, like Saturday is going to go wrong, and I, and you I didn't, didn't. You didn't take it. You just. I didn't just, take it at all. Yeah. No. <laughs> For the people that don't follow me or you on Twitter that just listen to this podcast, like I did, put it out there that Andy live, basically live texted me every single drink he was having. <laughs> like I would get pictures and video of like, this is my drink. This is where we're at. Here's this margarita. Should I get the shrimp? Should I not get the shrimp? The shrimp's been ordered. And then the you had some like shrimp. the popcorn shrimp. Uh, and then you also had some beverage that killed you, right? It was like jalapeno flavored. Like that was the pineapple ch- on fire. <laughs> the pineapple on fire. Oh my gosh. That thing. <laughs> the bartender was like, yo, this is spicy. I was like, cool. Sure it is. You know? Like, and I don't even like spicy things anymore. I used to be good with it, but I can't really handle it. But I just, you know, anytime you're ordering a drink that's they so spicy, I usually am like, yeah, right. <laughs> that thing, like especially after surfing because your lips kind of get you get chapped up a little bit yeah yeah and it just seared this heat into my (laughs) lips that didn't go away for like 45 minutes and diana normally is great at dealing with spice she had about a quart of that drink and i was like i'm not letting this one just sit here so i drank the rest (laughs) as you saw and it was just, it was an experience. It was like going, it was like chasing. It was interesting because it's like, they're both kind of margaritas. This one's super spicy yeah. and has a lot more pineapple in it. And it's like, you're going from one margarita. I'm using the other margarita to chase the spice from. So you, I'm just getting hammered, you know, it's like, I'm, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so it was quite the night. I distinctly remember laying down. And just the world was spinning. And I was like, okay, I need to go out and go out dancing or something. Cause I, otherwise I'm just going to be in a world of hurt. <laughs> so we went out on the town after that. And I was just like, it was fun. It was fun. So, yeah, I mean, the lead up to the game was solid, but, and the game itself, honestly, the first half was, I was like, oh yeah, you know, they came out, they punched us yeah. a little bit. We bounced back. We punched. We had, like we got the momentum. Like the the Casimir Allen touchdown right before the end of the half was tough. Um, and then oh yeah, and then my my troubles of dealing with trying to watch the game from Mexico. Yep. Were absolutely <laughs> hilarious. It's like sign on. They're like this game has ended. I'm like quite sure it hasn't. And then. <laughs> All of the feeds are like chopping up and breaking up. And then I'm using Diana's phone. And then it's like Diana's phone is like, yeah, sorry, you used all of your international data. Uh, now we're going to give you much slower data speed. So then it stopped working. So I had to move on to an illegal stream. And the illegal stream was money, like money. So good. Um, not too much of a delay or anything. But yeah, I mean, the game itself, like I thought we... You know, the one play I didn't get to see was the chase interception. The feed broke right as that play happened. And in reading about it, it sounds like that was a huge, huge play. Uh, I got to see the play like where. Well, it depends just kinda... on which, which interception are you talking about, too? No, 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 not the one before the... the. I saw that one, the okay. one before the end of the half. Um, the the more pivotal one, the, his first interception. The one where he just one. stared him down. Yeah. Got picked off, yeah. But, yeah, I mean, the first half, like, all in all, we played competitive football and probably left points on off the board, I felt. So it was almost one of those. But I I, I didn't think that the second half would go the way it did. And then 
the three and out, it's like our defense came out and really played an excellent defensive series. And then that offensive series, it was like, oh, damn. Like that, you know, it just, it was like, okay. And then, and then they had the big, long drive. And we're like, all right, we're going to answer. And it was like, no. Like the offense just was, <laughs> it was no. gone. Yeah, right? It was just gone. And it it very much spiraled. Like, I think a lot of people spiraled with it. Like Mm -hmm. I I felt myself spiraling with it. I was like having a hard time checking out of it and just being like, yo, I'm in a beautiful place right now. I didn't enjoy other aspects of life besides this. Like, but it was tough. It was tough and it didn't get any better. And I think that's the first time I had to make a judgment call. It was 1230 in the morning or whatever it was. And I I didn't want to like, you know, have to sleep until 11 to have a good day or anything like that. So I turned it off, I think, with about six minutes left in the fourth. It's probably the first time I've done that for, with a cow game in, you know, in, in quite a few years. And I have to, I, I do have to own this a little bit. So <laughs> last week, I talked about how largely Wilcox avoids blowouts. And that's why I liked him, right? That's exactly what I said. We even previewed yeah. it, dude. It was like yep. a preview audio clip. It was me talking about how... I like Wilcox because he's a competitive dude and in large part, he's competitive in every football that football game that he plays in. And I should have put the context that UCLA is the one team where he is not, I didn't do it. And guess what happens? We get our asses kicked and I'm over here looking like an idiot. So I own that to our listeners. You know, I'm not, that was my bad. (laughs) My bad. I I don't know. I don't. Okay. So we, we're, we can talk about the specifics a little bit, but like, let's just talk about the general stuff, right? Nothing went right. And, and that's like, you know, you broke it down to like the first half looked okay. And then the second half, you know, looked more abysmal. But for me, I'm like in the spur of the moment, it got worse. Just like you're, you're seeing it. But then when I step back and look at the whole game, it's like, we were abysmal from beginning to end. Um, so, so that for me, I'm like, I don't know how this team plays that game against Stanford the week before and granted Stanford's not as good, right? Where, you know, we, we have to put the context into it and Stanford's not that good. UCLA's was an eight, seven, win team at that point, eight, win team at that point, um, seven, win team at that point, uh, seven, win team at that point. And, um, they had beaten a, you know, not great LSU team, but still an SEC team. Uh, and I was like, oh, you know, you could you could convince me that we could probably win this game. You know, there are some ways that we could win it. And but then we got we got smash mouthed like we got we came out and we lose the toss. We come out on offense and Jerry Asnero, who is our former defensive line coach and now their defensive coordinator for a few years now, just decides to blitz us all night long like the the remember the titans quote was like he said it in the locker room before the game started to ucla right we we blitz all night yeah i don't want to see them gain another yard but coach the game hasn't started another yard (laughs) another yard like look, look like look at this uh rushing attempts 32 average per rush 2.9 our average on offense yards per play 3.4 like Does the rushing do the rushing totals include chase though like mm-hmm. sack and stuff cuz uh, i did feel like christopher brooks looked good yeah. early you know i think you're right i mean i think i remember reading like nam was like yeah largely d plus first half like so i i painted with a pretty optimistic brush in saying that but i just felt like with the casmir allen fumble and you know, the 14 unanswered points and the fact, honestly, that we got, we converted the touchdown, right? The, what's, what's our issue been all season in games like this, like red zone conversion. Well, we converted in the red zone. So I was like, I was like, all right, but the large, the peripherals around it, it's like you could make the case that that game should have been 17, seven UCLA at the half. Yeah. Rather than, and that we were kind of gifted very much so. Yeah. Um, right. Cause if you take it a step back, like the conversion thing, true, but also it wasn't that we forced the turnover. It's literally 
he's alone on a kickoff return and he muffed it like bad. So yeah. And it wasn't like we created that turnover versus the other side. They created a crap ton of turnovers. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and so yeah, it was, it was pretty ugly. I think like how, like to go back to your question, like how do you have the game against Stanford and then you have the game against UCLA? You know, one of the things that I texted you is like, it's very clear to me in this game, a lot of people were like, oh, this is reminiscent of the Washington State game. I was like, yeah, like pretty much is, you know, Washington State was just like, it was like Cal's offense didn't capitalize in that first half. And as the game progressed, it just got more aggressive and more aggressive and more aggressive. And we never made him pay for it. And it just looked like we couldn't do anything. And it kind of was a, it was a failure of two things that I saw it was one Chase's ability to make those throws. There's a couple of plays that he just didn't make the the mm-hmm. throws period. And at the end of the day, like he just didn't. And I, I don't know why, uh, but I think under pressure, Chase is just a very different quarterback. And the other piece here too, that I thought was interesting is like looking at DTR as a counterpoint to chase because our defense was getting good pressure on DTR all night long without blitzing without blitzing but he's so damn athletic that he would just escape outside of the pocket and turn it into positive yards and Chase can do that but he doesn't do it in the same way and I also felt like it was like DTR just he moves out faster like he rolls, he'll roll out faster than like Chase will be the pocket passer. DTR is like, I'm going to live outside of the pocket. I, that's how I felt. And like, yeah, he's making some stupid back, you know, off the back leg throws and lucky to get a, get away with a few of those. But at the same time, it gives him much more of an opportunity to get away from that pressure. For whatever reason, we don't seem to have the antidote to that defensive decision. We don't. If you're going to bliss us all night, it's like, well, if we don't hit those throws that force you to not do that, we yeah. just can't seem to figure out a way to get around it. Um, So I think that was one of the biggest core pieces of this game. And so the game that the reason why I really brought that up was not to actually tie it back to Washington State, but to tie it back to Arizona. What's so interesting to me about the Arizona game, and I never thought I would even be saying this, <laughs> is how at the beginning of that game, we had passes that were open. We had mm-hmm. plays that were open deep. And what happened? We missed every single one of those throws. And yep. as we missed those throws, Arizona said, well, great. You can't hit any of your throws. Now we're just going to bring the house. And what happened is our offense looked eerily similar to the offense that was in the UCLA game. And it wasn't our backup quarterback, nope. Glover. It was Chase that was back there. It was our starters that were back there. And they looked as inept as we did in certain moments in the Arizona game. So it was quite fascinating to even see that level of ineptitude after what was a pretty solid run of games for our offense, um, you know, when fully healthy against, you know, uh, Oregon State and Colorado and uh, Stanford and leading into, the, you know, the only game outside of that was like the Arizona. So did you see that similarity or was it just me? Like, I'm curious to kind of get your thoughts here. I think I saw similarities too, but I saw similarities to a different game. It's it's actually pretty fascinating for you to say it's it feels closer to the Arizona game. For me, it feels closer to the TCU game um, in a very weird way. Like, I I think it's a better, if you go play by play, it's the Arizona game is probably a more, a better comp. Um, But for me, it was like the time management, the game flow, like, you know, where it was like the ebbs and flows of the Cal team, like offensively and defensively, felt very much like the TCU game for me, right? Like, We found a little success early. We tried to capitalize on it. It didn't work. Then we, we, we get a lead and instead of trying to protect it and move forward, we consistently tried to do more risky things 
TCU gets the ball back to end the half. They score, they go up, and, you know, we never come back. We score off of a pick six in the red zone. You know, we scored off of their muff fumble in the red zone. Um, They almost make us pay for that end of the half uh, turnover. Like, we tried to go deep on that, right? And then we gave them uh, the ball back with enough clock, and DTR gunned it from, like, 55 yards out. And still, like, he laser beamed it. He didn't, he didn't put any arc on it whatsoever. He just zipped it basically to the end zone and almost came down with it. Thank God for Daniel Scott, um, who was there to knock it away. But that's why it felt similar to me, where we kind of were trying to force things. And, like, because certain things were working, instead of trying to do the other. Like, I'm not a big offensive guru, which is why I've, or, like, football tactics guru, which is why I follow, like, you know, all the NFL guys, and for us, it's like Nam and and uh, Peter and those guys, and they're going all right. You're, if they're blitzing, if they're blitzing more than five, why aren't you throwing the screen pass? <laughs> like they're committing, they're committing to going after the quarterback, right? It's not like they're they're dropping back and they have to figure out if they're you know um, that we're throwing a screen or not. Like they're committing. So if you can sell it, that's. That's like a, a screen a screen pass is just broad daylight with like four blockers, a running back, and only like two, three guys in the in the defensive backfield. And we and it worked when we did. And it also worked when we ran outside. But we just decide not to. Um and that cost us the game. Like even defensively, like we had some tackling issues that came up like earlier and I I guess throughout the entire game where we weren't committing to our tackles. There was one by ISF, which I was like, I was like so upset at. Cause he kind of just like threw his arms at, at DTR expecting him to be bumped off out, out of bounds. But it's like, or oh, it was Charbonnet. Sorry. It was Charbonnet. And it like, it barely nudged him. <laughs> and so, yeah, there was a lot of frustration across like how the team performed. And like, I am, I'm like baffled at how the team performed after what we saw on Saturday. Um, but like, I'm, I mean, all right, let me, let me ask you this. And for me, this is a bigger picture thing. You know, the craziness of college football has started, right? All of the coaching moves <laughs> over the last 48 hours, coordinators being fired, coordinators being let go, coordinators being hired, coordinators becoming head coaches, the whole shebang, everything is there. So, my big question, my big picture question to you is how many games this year, right? Because we're not, of course, we're not counting 2020, but I do want to add an addendum to that in a little bit. How many games this year do you think our offense was good? Like not, po- it doesn't have to be like we won or points scored, but just, hey, this looks like an offense that can compete. Like, let me, let, I'm out, I'll just go down the list with you and you just give me a fingers up if you think if it was right. All right, Nevada. Yeah, Nevada was no. Okay, TCU. See, I I have a hard time with TCU. Can I just toss it out because at the like that was the one where I was at a wedding. And that was the one where our long ball was outstanding. And but yeah, we like, and like and we didn't I, run. The the I was never able to find a good game tape. So like, I just don't feel like. Sure, let's toss out I, TCU. I want to toss it out. All right, Sac State. Okay, so I'll say yes. Yeah, okay. FCS opponent, sure. Uh, Washington. (laughs) We're driven by the search for better. But when it comes to hiring, the best way to search for a candidate isn't to search at all. Don't search match with Indeed. Indeed is your matching and hiring platform with over 350 million global monthly visitors, according to Indeed data, and a matching engine that helps you find quality candidates fast. Ditch the busy work. Use Indeed for scheduling, screening, and messaging so you can connect with candidates faster. Leveraging over 140 million qualifications and preferences every day, Indeed's matching engine is constantly learning from your preferences. So the more you use Indeed, the better it gets. Join more than 3.5 million businesses worldwide that use Indeed to hire great talent fast. And listeners of this show will get a $75 sponsored job credit to get your jobs more visibility at Indeed.com slash BlueWire. Just go to Indeed.com slash BlueWire right now and support our show by saying that you heard about Indeed on this podcast. That's Indeed.com slash BlueWire. Terms and conditions apply. Need to hire? 
you need Indeed. Oh, gosh. Oh. Uh, an Andy, yes, but it's debatable. Yeah. <laughs> okay. An Andy, yes, but it's debatable. All right. Washington State, a definite no. Definite no. Yeah. Oregon? Oh. <laughs> Dude. I think it's... I think what was this what was the exact way that you asked it again like where which games do you think you was happy with it where, yeah where you're happy with the performance of the offense doesn't necessarily mean what me won or scored but like you know you were like all right this is this is good enough okay so no no, no Oregon. Oregon okay so far still just one all right Colorado Okay, so now we know we're going to go yes on Colorado, yes well, on Oregon State, State, and yes on Stanford. So, yeah, no on Arizona, yes on Stanford. All right, and then no against UCLA. And we still have one more game left. So, out, out of tw- out of 11 games so far this season, that's four yeses. Wait, wait, wait we threw one out. Oh, we threw one out. Ten games. Yeah. Four games. So 40%. 40%. And who knows what team shows up against SC, right? Senior day and all that. Dude, so, I think we're going to beat SC, man. I, I like have zero <laughs> doubts. This <laughs> my my only my only dread to this SC game and this is my anecdote to SC is that because of the Lincoln Riley hire, some of these guys are like I need to play out of my life in order to maintain a spot here and someone just someone explodes. Like that is my only fear out of this game. Because they need to, they're they're going to need to like showcase themselves, right? To a certain degree, some some guy is going to get an opportunity because some NFL guy might not play in this, and so on, and just happens to have the game of his life. <laughs> Offensively, defensively, I don't know who is going to who's coaching them. Like, I it's 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 Dante Williams. I mean, who's still that yeah. coach? But yeah, yeah. So okay. So anyways, we're at forty percent, right? Do you We're get why I'm it. asking this question? Do you get what I'm trying I, to get? What I'm getting, trying to get? you're trying to say is like something along the lines of, do we look at a new coordinator? Like, I mean, that's is, that's the that's like the farther that's the that's the end end game question. But what I'm saying is, is there? Let's 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 not get to that question yet. Let's start a little bit before. Like, do we have concern over the trajectory of the offense? Because you know how after last season when we were doing our preview pod and our end of the end of the season pod and all that, you know, Nam and, and all those other guys, they're like, yeah, this this offense isn't going to work. Right. It's it's not going to work like they had seen enough already over the five games. And we were like, it's covid like you can't they it's like you can't really. But now that we've seen a year and a half worth of games, pretty much like I, I think those offenses that we saw in covid. Is pretty much the same offenses we're seeing now like there's not much of a difference in terms of what they're calling what they're doing um like there's evidence now that supports it so So here's 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 my fundamental frustration and i don't speak negative too negatively like this that often but my fundamental frustration with justin wilcox and the offense when it comes to the offense is it seems as though we have been trying to build a Wisconsin light, like a West Coast, West, West Coast, Wisconsin. A power run team with a slight more passing. Exactly. And I think that the fundamentals to doing that, to doing that are, are basically having an exceptional offensive line. And then you run behind that line and you have some pass to help out with it. But I just get frustrated because we get beat in the trenches. We get beat in the trenches by Washington State. We get beat in the trenches by UCLA. We get beat in the trenches by Oregon. We'll see how we do against USC. And and then we beat we win those battles against Stanford, Colorado, Oregon State. Um and, you know, we're maybe we're net even with a Washington. You, know, you could maybe make the case that we are closer to net even than, a, than an L against Oregon. But 
it starts to frustrate me there because that's the thing is like I'm looking for some sense of identity. Mm -hmm. And so what I hear you talking about the offense, I don't understand what this offense is. (laughs) Right. That's my core frustration with it because I think what you're seeing is like on some weeks you feel like we feel like we know what it is. We feel like, okay, we're going to establish this run game. And at the same time, then we have the next week and it just befuddles everybody because it all just falls to complete shit. And everyone is like, wait, what? Like, (laughs) where did this go? And I think it starts with the line. I really do. And, and we just, but this game, it, it starts with the line, and then there's ownership in the quarterback. And I think the thing that UCLA really brought to my attention is just like, dude, they have way more talent than us at the end of the day, period. DTR is a far more electric quarterback than I gave him any credit for. Absolutely, without a doubt. Like, And then Charbonnet, dude, that guy is amazing. He could not be tackled. It was unbelievable. He broke so many damn tackles. It was, it was, I was just impressed. And what I walked, I walked away from that game sort of being like UCLA had a level of athlete that we didn't have. And like, dude, we, we went hard for Casimir Allen. We went hard for him and we didn't get him. And like, my goodness, we could, we use a player like that. Of course. Like we, they use him in so many different ways. So long answer, not short. That therein lies the frustration for me on the offense is like what if you ask me what I'm investing in on I've said this all season long. I'm investing in the defense, right? Like I'm not going into next season saying keep Justin Wilcox because I think that the offense is gonna take a leap. I'm saying invest in Justin Wilcox because I think that defense has the opportunity to be really special and really special defenses can do really good things with a mediocre offense. But it's still frustrating to me that the entire tenure you've had an offense that has been basically, you know, mediocre and lacks a really an idea. Like, right. We couldn't figure out what it was, the Toyota Tercel (laughs) offense, (laughs) like, right. We couldn't figure it out. And then now we have Bill Musgrave in here and we're wondering the same thing. And on my end, I'm starting to think, I'm like, okay, is Graham Harrell going to stay at USC? And is he the type of coordinator that you want to like it? Wilcox like might have to be in a position that Harbaugh was in where he does have to change up coordinators and he might have to say, all right, you know what? I'm going to go to an air raid, the most modern form of, and like bail on that idea of what, you know, he's wanted to run, which is that pro style offense. And I just, I don't know if we have the personnel to do it, but uh, that's, the, the lack of offensive identity for me is just, I just don't know what I'm investing in. So when people are like, well, is Kai going to be able to come in and perform in this offense? I was like, I don't know. He could be a super dynamic player. He could offer more to us than potentially what we've seen with Chase just in regards to sheer athleticism. But I don't know if that's going to produce a different result if we're still just like, you know, completely disappearing against opponents. Where are you at on this? Super curious to get your thoughts. I'm like, oh, this is rough. I I wanted to abstain judgment until the end of the season. And technically, this week should have been the end of the season. So I guess uh, we're at. I think we're there. I don't think there's anything that as that the game can be against, or I don't think there's anything the offense could do against SC for me to not to for me to get back on the Musgrave train. Like I am off it. I think I'm fully off it. I'm there's there's been no consistency in, as you said, an identity of the team. We try to get too cute. Like, you know, there's like you know, I I don't know if this is like how the meetings go or whatnot, but they're you know how like Wilcox t- says like they self scout, right? And like, you know, what if it's one of those situations where like we ran the ball damn well and we're like they self scouted and they're like, oh, they're going to think we're going to run a lot this week. So we're going to come out and just throw the deep ball. And that's all we're going to practice all week. Like, I don't know if that's that's how it goes, but that's that's kind of how it feels sometimes week to week, right? 
we run the ball so well against UCLA and come or against Stanford. And then we come out and then what do we do? It's like, we're just going to throw deep balls. We're going to throw a couple deep balls, like to start off the game instead of trying to establish that run again. And, you know, we, they threw on J Mike and he almost came down with his first pass of his career, which was, which would have been really nice. Cause that was a very nice deep ball thrown. Um, and he had a chance to get it. If he had, if Chase had thrown him a little bit further, that's a, that's a touchdown. Um, it was, it was a underthrown pass by Chase who had yep. a touchdown there. Yep. And I also still think J Mike should have made that catch two hands on the football inbounds. But come on. I think so dude. too. I think so too. I think he's got to make that play. Yeah. But at the end of the day, it was the throw. That was the issue. Yeah. More so he than had to the come catch. back to it. But uh, yeah, I think that's why I'm kind of off this Musgrave train. I feel like we tried to do too many things. We, the the biggest thing for me is we don't do one thing well. Yeah, exactly. There's right? not so you just can't. There's not a single it, thing that we've done well all season. We've done things well at certain points in the season, but we've not. We haven't even done a single thing well all season. The only oh I, no I. No, I, I lie. I lie. The only single thing we've done well is when Chase scrambles. <laughs> That's the only good thing we've done. But even then, we saw that li- the limitations of that with a, you know, with a front four, with kind of like a QB spy that kept him in check. Right, and, that, and that's what you saw against UCLA is that he would try to take off, and there was already a hand on him. Yeah, exactly. I think that. Yeah, that's it. It's just. And, and what I was trying to voice today on Twitter was that my frustration right now is now that we've seen the bananas off season with, we'll mention, a, I'll mention a few of them, like Lincoln Riley moving to USC, Kalen, uh, I'm going to forget, I'm gonna, DeBear, DeBoer, 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 DeBoer going to Washington, Great Washington hire, by State, the way. yeah, it's, uh, it's a nice hire, Washington State sticking with the Mm-hmm. It was Jake Reichert, Rickert, Reichert. Yeah. Um, and then, so you have all of this change and we, and it sounds like from Wilner, but who the hell knows if that's accurate, that Arizona state is going to implode and that there's going to be this plethora of players available, right? So you have players that were at one point leaving USC. So there's a lot of talent leaving USC. There's a boatload of players that are decommitting from Oklahoma, but I don't think we'll compete for those. Washington was up in the air. Arizona State's up in the air. Washington State has a new coach. Like, we, we have this unique opportunity this offseason, and even at five and seven, right? Assuming we win against USC, to be like, look, we had a, a bit of shitty luck this year. If and, and look, I'm selling now. So I don't need someone to be like, it wasn't luck. That's fine. I'm just going to be selling the program to an 18 year old. We had a bit of shitty luck this year, but we have everybody back in a position in a world where everybody else has no certainty besides like Oregon State and Oregon. And by the way, what you hinted at with like Moorhead leaving to Akron to be the head coach and all of these positions coming up and what we've seen, like Cristobal is no, no longer guaranteed to be at Oregon. I don't ne- think that's necessarily a good thing for us. I actually don't think he's that good of a in-game coach. But nonetheless, there might be some uncertainty there. So you have all of this happening, but we aren't in a position to capitalize on it because of two reasons. One, we're still dealing with the BS from this stupid COVID thing and all of these articles coming out. And if it's Wilcox feeding that, which many people think it is, or if it's writers that are doing that, or his agent, I don't know what it is, but it's not serving us. And the second piece is we don't have that investable identity. There's nothing that I can go to as Bill Musgrave to recruit, like you're saying, and be like, hey, you're a five star tight end or you're a four star tight end. Like, look at what we did with Jermaine Terry this year. We did nothing. So we don't have anything that we can say that would excite that person. Okay, what do we do on the running side? Well, 
We had Damian Moore, who was running really well, and he fumbled twice, and then we benched him for the eternity. We have Chris Brooks, who looks great, and we don't feed him the ball. And we have a bunch of electric, speedier backs that we don't feature or showcase at all in the offense. And then on the passing side, you might look at it as a quarterback. This may be the only one and be like, if I was a dual threat quarterback, okay, this could be kind of fun because I have some good receivers to throw to. And if I'm a wide receiver, I'm like, well, shit, I better have a good quarterback throwing me the ball because I don't see him all that often. Right? So, like, that's my frustration is like what am i selling or getting somebody to invest into on the offensive side of the ball on defense i'm like okay look at the progression of lou hearns look at the progression of colin gamble look at how we rotate our linebackers if you're a a defensive end holy hell we need you to come in here and just do your thing and dominate because if you can this defense is going to be really good very easy for me to pitch the defensive identity of this team but it's so hard for me to pitch the offensive identity I think Bill Musgrave will get three years, you know, I just do, but I don't know. I just wish we had a better sense of like what that was and what that meant. And that, and if we don't know, and we spend all this time watching these games, how the hell are the high school kids going to (laughs) know? Right. I mean, you make such valid points and that's the thing. Like, that's what I was going to say is like, you can take game film into like any of these kids houses and show them and it's going to just be like, well, but you didn't do that like regularly. Like, <laughs> You did that against like certain opponents, but not certain other opponents and like certain guys got touches, but certain guys didn't. Um, though I think high school athletes and, and like, you know, college football recruits in, in, more specifically do a little bit more in terms of, you know, analyzing the sport. But yeah, I think you, I think you're spot on. Like, and so here's, here's my thing of how it all ties back to Wilcox to a certain degree. I think you and I are still Wilcox believers. I think uh, for the majority of people that I talk to um, that, you know, know the program or around the program a lot more than just us watching games. They love the dude. They think he's doing the right things for the program. And uh, I don't know if this is before or after, but I have a conversation with, uh, spoiler alert, Ed Quinn, who's a uh, a TV president. Like, he's he plays a president on TV. <laughs> but uh, an actor, of course. Uh, he's awesome. Uh, had a great conversation with it. But I digress. His one thing that he was talking about when he – like and and Wilcox is when I asked him what he thinks the state of the program is and he's just like you see it how he interacts with the people like you saw the COVID thing and you saw him on TV at the on when he was at Arizona he he could have spilled all the beans and just thrown like like everyone under the bus but you didn't he might do it behind closed doors because that's where he needs to be a little bit more keep my foot down and be you know assert my point and but outwardly he's never going to do anything that damages the program he's never going to do anything to hurt the players he's never going to do anything to hurt his coaching staff and so like he's doing it the right way just just always going to take the high road never going to get into the mud fight you know at least as a like a persona right which i think is great i think that's absolutely great i just think him as a head coach in terms of coordinators like and like you know hiring firing whatever whatever the term may be he needs to be a more, bit more ruthless you've had wendy's nugs dipped in sauce but have you had them covered in sauce wendy's new saucy nugs take the crispy and spicy nugs you love and turn them up to 11 choose between flavors like buffalo or honey barbecue garlic parm or if you're a real heat seeker out there you can try spicy ghost pepper only on wendy's signature spicy nugs listen i'm gonna dare you to do it i dare you that's seven delicious ways to try the nugs that you already love pick a flavor grab some extra napkins and then grab a few more napkins and prepare to nug like you've never nugged before for a whole new way to nug it's got to be wendy's at participating u.s wendy's like, I think that's a part of like the head coaching job that a lot of head coaches need, but they don't. And that's like not just co- collegiate sports, right? That's like across all sports. Like, um, like, you know, year after year two of Bo Baldwin, we were kind of out on it, right? I think everyone kind of knew, like we knew what the ceiling was, but he still kept him around for that third year. 
and you know did all right we got to a bowl game and and we won on that in that final bowl game but like it it didn't really move the needle and then bill musgrave's been here for a year and a half the needle hasn't moved it's been the same spot since it was at baldwin and like if we can see that like coaches definitely can see that but like is it is it blind optimism that they have more for how they think this offense is going to go? Or is it like, you know, excuses might not be the right word, but circumstantially, like certain things happen in the game that didn't let this offense thrive. Of course, it comes down to execution of the players on the field, right? You know, you can game plan as much as you want, but if, if Chase isn't making the throws that you're asking him to make, then, you know, what's the point of having this awesome game plan? But if I, I'm going to keep like cycling myself, but at the same time, like if you know Chase can't make those throws or can't make those reads or whatnot, and you're forcing him to do it, is that really good coaching? Like it, it keeps it keeps going itself in a circle, right? And we just we're not a part of those conversations, so we have no idea like what goes in and around that program. Um, but but all in all, what I'm trying to say is, I feel like this right now, it's the worst. It is the absolute worst offseason to get into a head coaching hire cycle, right? Absolute worst. Because you see the money that's being thrown around, you see the names that are being moved, and you still see some of the jobs that are open. But this is the absolute best, best market to get into a coordinator hire. Because everyone's moving. No one's secured. The only guys that are secured are probably the guys Lincoln Riley is taking from Oklahoma to to SC and maybe some of the Fresno guys that Kalen DeBoer's are yeah, Kalen DeBoer's taking over to, to Washington, but all in all, like there's a lot of coordinators out there offensively and defensively. I don't think we'll make any change defensively, but for the sake of the argument, I'm just saying that there are a lot of out there like available, you know, collegiate, maybe a little younger, maybe a better recruiter because it seems like the trend for Wilcox has been to go a little bit more towards recruiting. It hasn't pay, it hasn't paid off with Angus, right? At all. Um, Burl Toller's been, I think, a st- stud at wide receiver recruiting and development. TBD with Jeep Christ because you know, I who knows like who he's recruiting or who we're recruiting. Aristotle Thompson hasn't brought in a single running back um, in his two years here now, but at the same time, the running backs do look better with him coaching with him coaching them over the last two years. Uh, and so, yeah, and then it, and then it comes down to Bill Musgrave and that offensive coordinator job. So I think there's, there's has, there has to be a discussion there at the very least in a, who knows what's happening. Um, Musgrave, if I looked up, I know Tr- uh, Trace did a Musgrave like contract thing, like bef- when Musgrave was fired, I looked it up yesterday. His contract, barring an extension that happened that we don't know about, expires January 22nd of 2022. It's a two-year deal. So, um, I don't know. It's it's weirder for us right now. And I said this, like, I think in our, like, our writer's Discord channel. I was just like, it's weirder for us because our college football news cycle is on a week delay because we have another game. Like... And by that, because we're not in a bowl game, so it doesn't matter. It's just like our regular season was extended another week. So we're not going to make any hiring changes or firings like in this week. You do that after the season's over. Season hasn't been over yet. So that's why like, I'm curious to see if we do make any changes after the SC game. So next week is going to be a very, very key week for us. Or if we stick it all together, then then there's a, okay, then how? what are we doing? Like, are we recruiting well enough to keep those hires or keep the staff intact? Was there enough optimism going into next year? I don't know. I. It's a, There's a lot of questions. <laughs> there's a lot of questions. I mean, for me, it's the questions that I have is like, for it's like if you're going to hire someone new, um, I mean, look, I don't know if you renew Musgrave then, truthfully. Yeah. I think that's a tough sell. And I do agree. I think you're, what you're talking about is like going younger. Is it, That's a better path. It's more fun. More players will buy into it. 
But like for me, it's like when it comes to recruiting, I don't really care so much if you can recruit high schoolers because I don't think you have that type of leash. It, it does matter. So like Aristotle Thompson's a good example, right? Because he, he's gotten the commitments and then they've just decommitted yeah. because of our on-field performance. Yep. But he's gotten the commitments of the guy. Like he can clearly sell it. Yeah. But has a hard time sustaining it. It's not really his fault. We're not backing it up. So maybe he's overselling, you know, maybe he's not talking about the university enough, but to me, like what we need is someone that's going to be able to come in and take this offense and improve it on the field with who we have. Right. And, but, and then recruit, not high school, but transfer portal. Yeah. I want someone that's going to be able to come in, get people excited and pull in that like just the same way that we're gonna have a plethora of availability of coordinators. I think we're gonna have a plethora of availability of talent from players. There's so many players out there. Every single day I'm on Twitter, it's like, oh, this person is entering the transfer portal. <laughs> and I post my little two eyes on Twitter. Yep. I'm like, this seems like a perfect person for us to go after. You know, the one that is a, a good one, an interesting one is Sermon's nephew, um, which I would, assume has high likelihood of us being really interested in, in targeting. So well, the question, that would be at the cool. Well, that one, that one I will slightly dispute because I actually heard, I actually was talking about this with uh, Christopher H. Was it Christopher H? It was one of the other writers. Uh, we were chatting about it and he was like, yeah, like that might by a family connection be a right one, but he got benched for a freshman quarterback at central Michigan after transferring from Washington. Don't know if that means, you know, talent wise, you know, it'd just be a power five version of Ryan Glover, right? The guy who got benched. Yes, well, had his second should be better. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, there's a lot of talent yep. that's out there and going to be stands. out there. And I need someone that's going to come in and just get people excited about being a part of it. And that's why I mentioned a name like Graham Harrell. It might not be that, but like of someone that's younger like that. Hello, Mike, that San come... Mike Sanford Jr. Hello. I heard you just got released from Minnesota. If you're listening to this. Reach out. That was the guy that was at Notre Dame, right? Stanford, Before? yeah. And he was also at Stanford. He was the running backs and recruiting coordinator at Stanford. Um, and he was Minnesota's offensive coordinator. Coordinator? Yeah, he was Utah State's offensive coordinator with Jordan Love and then Minnesota. Yeah, he'd be perfect. Um, He's best friends with Sermon, and, apparently. So, I emoji. That would be, that's what I'm, <laughs> that's what I'm looking for. Yeah. You know? And if we roll out the same. Look, I, 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 this is. I think it becomes, you know, we didn't go bowling. If we went six and six and had gone bowling, I think that this season you would have said next season Wilcox been pretty damn safe. Three, you know, bowling every year of a real season, but now we don't, and uh, I think that the seat's a little warmer, and in so doing, that forces you to look at this and say, okay, I can't look at this as long term as I might have once wanted to. So let me go ahead and like get somebody in here who can help us win now. And like, I hope we do that because I truly think that this defense, a lot of people have been like talking about this defense to UCLA game. I'm sorry. If the defense plays 95% of the football game, I'm not taking any <laughs> stock in them not playing well. They played damn fine in the first half of the football game when they weren't on the field and every single play and the second half, you're asking them to tackle two of the most dynamic players in the entire Pac-12 and in, do, in doing it over and over and over again with zero breaks. Literally, we're going three and out instantly and giving them the ball right back. So I still, I still believe that this defense is absolutely the right. It's the time to go for it is next year. And we're going to get Brett Johnson back. We're going to be able to get Ancelotos in the linebacking unit. We might have Coin Dang back on a medical red shirt. Like, there's a lot to like about Cal's defense going into next season. And the emergence of Achille Calhoun will be great, as well as a couple others on the D line. Like, I just, Wilkins, like, don't even get me started. So, if that's the case, holy hell, you got one more shot. Fix the damn offense, get somebody in that's exciting, somebody that's, you know, maybe a running back coach, right? Because we can build that identity behind being a running program. And then we can attract the Jay knots and say, look, this is an offense that you can invest in, that you can grow in and that you will become a star in the NFL. In. Yeah. Yep. 
I think that's a good place to close it. But we do have some fan questions and comments that we got to run through real quick. Because, you know, the people the people want to connect, Andy. The people want to connect with us. First one's from Sid. I'm pretty upset. Not going to lie. I didn't think our offense would play like this. Why do you why do you guys think Justin Wilcox has a hard time against Chip Kelly teams? I saw a stat backing this. Let's just win against USC and learn from the loss. All we can do. <laughs> I think that Justin Wilcox has a really hard time against Jerry as an RO defenses. <laughs> as an offensive coach? And uh yeah, like he just it seems like as an ROs, he just dominates Cal. He doesn't dominate anybody else. He dominates us. Um, we have a hard time. I mean, I know Wilcox has had a tough time in his previous coordinator since also against Chip Kelly. I think that the Chip Kelly offense is a good offense. Like it worked in college for many years. It's worked in the NFL at the highest level of the sport. And it's working again this year for UCLA. Like, I just think it's a good, it's a tough offense to stop, especially when you have athletes like you have in Casimir Allen, in DTR. DTR, in Charbonnet. Like, dude, that's ridiculous. There's thunder and lightning, and then you have a dual threat quarterback like that. Like, I just was really impressed more so with UCLA. And, you know, I think I had lower expectations around this game, and which is why the Arizona game was so big. Just didn't really know if we were going to be able to pull off the UCLA win. Had a little bit of hope there when we were up, you know, a yep. 14 unanswered. Yep. And then I was like, okay. So um, I don't have a good, I guess that's not a great answer, but that's sort of how I can have helped myself get through it. All right. We move on to the next one. One from Brennan. Uh, he says, on a lot of the re- interception replays, it seems like Garbers is staring down his target receiver. Is this more like a bad habit? He also follows up. He says, sorry, shit ad. I asked because in a lot of broadcasts, the commentators talk about waving off defenders with the QB's eyes so the target receiver has a better chance of success. Seemed like the Bruins defense just watched Garbers' eyes. So I actually saw this question earlier and um, I actually formulated a somewhat good of an answer for this. Is uh, on the... Yeah, the one where he stared down, not the not the deep ball that was or the the medi- the intermediate that was picked off. The one I know exactly which one you're talking about, Brennan. Um he has two defenders in his face. Like he's he looks to his left and then he looks to his right and he sees two defenders blitzing and they're pretty much like already in his face. He sees the one defend he sees the one uh wide receiver that's open doesn't have enough time to readjust his eyes, doesn't have enough time to look to his left or his right, anywhere else to throw, except there was a swing pass on in the flat that was open. But he doesn't have time to see that because we're seeing this in slow-mo. We're not seeing this in game time. as like a 6-3 defensive end is bull rushing and going past your right guard. Um, so, so he sees that, he throws it. What he doesn't realize is that the corner, they were playing zone. It looked like they were they were playing man initially, but the corner hands him off or the linebacker hands him off to the corner or the corner hands him off to the linebacker. And he thinks whoever he saw initially was with him and he had gotten separation, which is why he throws there. But he doesn't realize is that there's another defender that's covering coming in and covering that space, which is why he reads that he reads Chase's eyes, sees the gap, jumps the route. And that's the way the cookie crumbles. Yeah, that's a great breakdown. I think the one thing that I would say, it's a little off topic, but hopefully relevant enough. My issue with Chase in this game didn't wasn't so much about him like staring down receivers. I actually just felt like he checked down way too fast. Yep. Way too fast. And that the po- that when there were pockets that were created by the offensive line, he checked out of them way before the receivers had a chance to get open and it killed us. And UCLA was ready for it, and they would just we got zero positive gains out of those plays. And so I don't know if it's trust in the O line or what was happening. I mean, but that was my big frustration. My thing to that, I would say, is just it was probably all the blitzes that got to him earlier in the game, and then he just got happy feet in in like mentally, right? It was just like 
like if he felt too if he felt like the cuff pocket was too comfortable he probably started to feel like oh i'm gonna get tackled soon and i just need get, i just need to get it up pressure on chase brings out the weirdest thing dude yep. like i mean like trevin clark was open on that deep ball like there was just plays that i'm like you, we've seen you make these throws and sometimes it just looks like you used to see a different quarterback out there than the week before but um you know yeah he's helped us win a ton of games this year um last one is from scott cali scotty on Twitter, he says, is there any chance for a bowl with a win against SC? If not, wouldn't it make a lot of sense to play a future QB for us like Kai? We might as well get him some game experience before next year since we are only playing for pride at this point. Well, I'll answer the first part of the question. There is no chance for a bowl game. There are 83 teams that are eligible for a bowl. There are only 82 bowl games. So, or I mean, sorry, um, not 82 bowl games. There's 83 teams that are el- eligible. There are only 82 spots available for bowl games. So one team is not going bowling. So here's, okay. I will say you might have a couple of teams that opt out. Yeah. Coaching uh, that's changes. True. It's true. So it might not be a hundred percent out. But both of us have been pretty aligned on this. Like, yeah, put Kai out there. Absolutely, I would support that. You know, if there's zero chance. The thing is, what I what I have a hard time with is we so often look at records. We look at Pac-12 records. We look at overall records. We look at wins and losses. So I have a hard time sometimes telling a coach to throw away a game. Not that Kai's a throwaway, but like telling him to not put his best maybe chance out there to win because if we're going to continue to hold their conference records over their heads and their win totals over their heads, then it's like the same way. Like remember when Tony La Russa benched uh, his player for hitting a position yes. player, hitting a home run off of a position yep. player. It's like that home run mattered way more to that individual player in his arbitration case than it does to the White Sox organization or some stupid utterance who yeah. the game. And so I sort of feel that the same way now. It's like if we're just going to hold our coaches responsible and use them as these wins and losses as arguments to support reasons for getting rid of them, then you're going to force coaches into positions to, to want to win every single game possible and not play the younger guys. So when we might want to see development there, if we were looking with a long-term lens and said, yeah, Wilcox, you're safe, we believe in you, Sure. Why not? Right. Like if he feels comfortable, then he would definitely do it. But if we're putting out into the ether, into the, into the world that, Hey, like every win matters and you're on the hot seat, then he's going to, like, he's going to want to get as many wins as possible. And he's, so that's not going to happen as much. I think if you see, if UCLA had been the last game of the season, we might've seen Kai in the second half after like how the first half went, but, but because it's SC at home senior day, because we haven't had senior day yet, um, you're not pulling chase. <laughs> you're not pulling chase on senior you're day. You're not pulling chase <laughs> on senior day. Yeah. And no Wilcox, and then the other thing, the bigger picture thing, is that Wilcox is too big of a competitor to to let that happen. That's why I said that's my thing was if we were knocked out of bowl eligibility, like let's say by the Washington State game, um, uh, or the the Oregon State game, then I say there's no reason to play Chase the rest of the year, right? But that's not the case. If it's a one off, like a single game, nah. You 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 play Chase. Maybe we might see Kai in the fourth quarter. You know, like maybe it's just one of those games where even if we're losing or winning, we'll just throw him on there and just give him some game rep or Zach Johnson or whoever maybe. Um, but in terms of like the whole game itself like nah we we wouldn't do that to to the seniors and i honestly i wouldn't feel good if we did that to our seniors not on not on their senior night yeah good that's a great point great point that's uh that's it let's go beat sc because this might be the last time that we can really (laughs) beat them in a very long time Well, (laughs) well let me i mean i think we could also like not I mean, he could, uh, what's it? Lincoln Riley could also not be there in a couple of years. He could be in the NFL. Someone actually made a joke about this, about how, you know how Cliff Kingsbury was the OC at SC for like, like a week. 
they were saying that he Lincoln Riley is about to be announced as the new head coach of the Las Vegas Raiders. <laughs> It'd be hilarious. It would be absolutely hilarious. Um, Yeah, that's it. We haven't done this in a while, but I did want to close with something uh, for our victory cannon. Um, So I got one. You can think of one if you if you can't think of once. But it's this this Tuesday, November 30th was Giving Tuesday, right? It was just like, you know, on all social media, it's like where you can give to uh, platforms and other, you know, organizations that need help. Um, one of my best friends growing up, one of my best friends, Matt Kearney, uh, did basketball coaching work, uh, out in Africa. COVID brought him home. He lives in Chicago. I was at his wedding a couple of years ago. And, um, but he is a part of the Chicago chess foundation in Chicago. And, uh, they're looking to uh, raise some money um, to help the community and uh, what that after school program does uh, for the youth in the city and for the kids and teaching them how to play and um, and all the other life lessons that might come with playing. You know, uh, I call it a, I consider it a sport, uh, a sport like chess. Uh, so, yeah, if you have the opportunity and you're willing um to to help out that would be the one charity i would recommend since we're still recording this on a tuesday um the chicago chess foundation uh matt actually wanted just 500 dollars on facebook uh but and he already he already raised it so uh he doesn't need it but that's the one foundation that i would i'm gonna uh throw out there so the chicago chess foundation that's great love that that's a great one. Let's end with that. All right. Well, uh, that's it for us on the Golden Bear Cast. You can find me at Rob11HWANG. You can find Andy at Andy J Beast Mode. You can find all our stuff on rightforcalifornia.com and also find us on Twitter at Golden Blogs. Once again, we have a podcast that's either out there already or will be out there uh, with Ed Quinn. Please listen to it. It is such a great listen. Uh, his entire Cal journey, how his grandmother uh, graduated from Cal in 1930. Like it is, it is wild. Like his story is awesome. And he's an awesome dude. Uh, I can't wait to actually meet him in person, uh, hopefully at the SC game. Um, but yeah, take a listen to that. I really would appreciate the listen. And uh, that's it from us. As always, go Bears. Go Bears. We're driven by the search for better. But when it comes to hiring, the best way to search for a candidate isn't to search at all. Don't search match with Indeed. Indeed is your matching and hiring platform with over 350 million global monthly visitors, according to Indeed data, and a matching engine that helps you find quality candidates fast. Ditch the busy work. Use Indeed for scheduling, screening, and messaging so you can connect with candidates faster. Leveraging over 140 million qualifications and preferences every day, Indeed's matching engine is constantly learning from your preferences. So the more you use Indeed, the better it gets. Join more than 3.5 million businesses worldwide that use Indeed to hire great talent fast. And listeners of this show will get a $75 sponsored job credit to get your jobs more visibility at Indeed.com slash BlueWire. Just go to Indeed.com slash Blue Wire right now and support our show by saying that you heard about Indeed on this podcast. That's Indeed.com slash Blue Wire. Terms and conditions apply. Need to hire? You need Indeed. 